Welcome. Welcome. Oh boy, it's so much fun. You're going to walk out of here thinking, I never knew that God being wise was going to impact my life so much. Because everyone would say, even non-believers, if you're going to have God, he's got to be wise. That's a part of the, of the job description for God. You've got to be wise. You just wait. It is so amazing. I love this. Over my computer in my bedroom, I have taped on the wall all these things, and I change them so it's nothing, not beauty. There's no, I mean, they're taped on there. And there are three out of studying about his wisdom because they have changed my life so much, and I need to look at them and go, yes, this is true, yes, this is true, so it can, I can be impacted. Um, let's pray, and then we'll get started. Oh, Lord, thank you. You are the only wise God. We thank you so much. I ask you to be here with us. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Use our words, use my words, use the thoughts of our minds and our spirits and our emotions, actually our words, our ability to see the words in the book and in the Bible and even write. Lord, hear those listening at home. Please, we welcome you. We ask you to take control and show us yourself. To you be all the glory. Amen. Amen. All right, we are in the book, page 173, 193, excuse me. If you, um, but you don't need to turn there yet. So if you want to mark it, just keep it closed. So don't even open your bookshelf. If you're at home and you haven't been with us before, we're using Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, and we're reading through it together. So you need to get one or borrow one. Okay, so don't open your books yet. Uh, I'm going to start a little bit, and then we're going to uh, do some board thinking, B-O-A-R-D, board thinking, and move along with this, okay? Here is Dr. Grudem's definition of wisdom. God's wisdom means that God always chooses the best goal. So his wisdom, God being wise, or his wisdom, in his wisdom, he always chooses, chooses the best goals. The best goals, these are the kind of things you're going to want to put on your wall. Um, and the best means of getting to those goals. And the best means to get to those goals. So God, God's wisdom is he always chooses the best goals and the best means to get to the goals. That his decisions about what he will do are always wise and they always bring around the best results. They always bring the best results. So his wisdom, he has the best goals, the best means to get the best goals, and in that, another way of saying it, is the best results as well. Okay, so he will get to the goals and the results through the best means. All right, I'm going to ask you, what, looking at this, can we say about God? What are some things either about him that we can conclude from this? And what attributes must he have in order for this to be true? Sovereignty. Sovereignty? Why is that? Well, if it's, otherwise we would have too much. I mean, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Yeah. He's got to be in control of it. So he has to be in control in order for this to happen. Very good. What other attributes or what else can you say something about this? All powerful. Okay. Omnipowerful. Omniscient. Omniscient. Potent. Omni meaning all, potent, powerful. Omniscient. Why, why omnipotent? So he actually has the ability to carry it out. He has the power to carry it out. Why omniscient? He has the full knowledge. He has to have the knowledge to do it, doesn't he? Anything else that you can, we can say, well, we can conclude about God, or this is an idea about God? His goodness. Fair it's going to be the best goal that 
Yes. Has to be good. Are we thankful he's good? Mm -hmm. Very good. Independence. Independence. Why independence? Because he can't be relying on anybody else to get the best results. He must. He can't rely on anybody. If he were asking me, I would goof it up. <laughs> Doesn't need us, does he? But he loves us. Excellent. Some more? Love goes in there, too. What is? Love. Love? Because he wants the best yeah. possible what about results. This? Do you think about God choosing? Remember if you were with us last week when we were talking about uh, his unchanging? We got into a whole thing about God's emotions and his um, being. And to realize sometimes I kind of forget God chooses. I mean, actually another word would be determines. But it's still, he determines God before the foundation of the world. He chooses. He does make choices. And because he is wise, he always chooses the best goals, the best means, the best results. Okay, any of you in kind of a rough place right now or anything not perfect in your life? Raise your hand. Okay, do you always feel right now that the best goals, the best means, the best results, and the best time you are going on in your life? Only because I have been through attitudes twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. I have been transformed. And you have to keep telling yourself mm -hmm. And thanking him that he does this. <laughs> this is true. Yes. And since this is true, uh, that's, she's already given me the last thing. Because Sorry. this is true, my, no, that's <laughs> it. My trust for him has skyrocketed just because of the kind of wisdom that he has. This is so practical. Any other thoughts on this? I don't Actually, know what attribute it would be, but it, it's that he's, he's so personal. The means, the means are so oh, unique. What did we talk about last time that was kind of personal? Eminent. Eminent. Remember? Eminent or personal. Yes. Because this is not just about the history of the world. This is your life. Okay? I love, you know, John Piper saying when God does one thing, he does a million things. Okay? In your life alone, how many of these decisions and functioning and doings had to happen for your day to go the way your day has. I mean, so many. There are a million things in your life and my life. I mean, we just got this like trillion power thing going on because he's wise. <coughs> Any other thoughts? By the way, y'all are getting A's today. I'm just comping right now. <laughs> can, we, can we talk about the word goals? Uh-huh. Um, Would you I'm just surprised by that definition. How about, yes. How about purposes? Plans? Mm -hmm. Okay. Talk about where he ends up. Results is really the, the mm -hmm. results. What happens is what he had. Why have you haven't listened to us? Go back and listen to Uncondition, um, Unchanging. His purposes and plans, his goals, the results, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. but tweak, may have to tweak his definition a little bit again. Excellent, though. Y'all all say she's a little bit goal sounds like, oh, I think I can make it. Okay. Oh, she made lots of goals on Saturday. Okay. Well, anyway, just an example. All right, we're going to be working this. This is amazing. This is what I want you to do all the time about everything. Be a thinking woman, not a wimpy thinker, strong thinker, Strong theology, not a wimpy woman of theology, and think all the time. Look how much you thought about wisdom just applying the attributes you know. That's the way you're supposed to do. Reading the word, somebody said, just don't, I'm, I'm not interested in the word, it's boring to me. Well, start doing like this, challenge yourself. How much can I find of God's attributes hidden in here, whatever your son is doing? A devotional or whether it's reading the word itself, think like this. And I've got to move on because we have too much to do today. Um, okay, so here's our struggle right here. It doesn't always look like this. You know, we go back to purposes and plans. 
how it looks a lot of times like it's thwarted, it's goofed up. I'm usually the one blowing it, but it could be other things. So again, we're going to go back to the same place. This is either true or it's not. P.S. It really is true. Okay, you want to open your books? And now you can open to page 193 in Dr. Grudem's Systematic Theology. So as you're opening, I'll set, read it again. God's wisdom means that God always chooses the best goals, purposes, and plans, and the best means to those goals. This definition goes beyond the idea that, of God knowing all things and specifies. So this is much greater than simply omniscient. Much bigger than just the fact that he knows everything. Everything future, present, past in one moment. Besides that, this is a deeper word. Um, Okay, this, I couldn't find myself. This definition goes beyond the idea of just God knowing all things and specify that his decisions about what he will do are always wise decisions. That is, they always will bring about the best results from God's ultimate purpose, perspective, and they bring about the results by the very best <coughs> means. Now, one of the things I want you to be thinking about, because I'm going to ask you later, what would come under the heading very best means? Because there are a lot of subheadings, topics that would come under best means. So as you're thinking, you at home do the same thing. Keep your pen out when you think, oh yeah, that would include means as well. Oh, that would be means. How many things are best means? So start putting things that would have to be included under means. I'll just throw one out there for you time. That's one of our big ones. So if you just keep next to you and keep writing down thoughts you have about what are best means, or what would be, what would be a mean. Um, scripture affirms God's wisdom in general in several places. He's called in Romans 16, 27, the only wise God. Job says that God is wise in heart in 9, 4. And with him are wisdom and might. He has count <laughs> Close. Again, I can break anything, can I? Um, I think this needs to be tightened. Oh, thank you very much. You want to pause just for a second? God is even wise over tightening things that should be tightened. Um, so let's go back. With him are wisdom and might. He has counsel and understanding in Job 12, 13. Remember what's going on in Job's life. Okay, in the book of Job. And look what it's saying already about God with being wise. Do you think by the 12th chapter of Job, Job, everybody was convinced that God was really having the best goals, the best means, the best results? No. Okay, still look probably pretty hard. But look what he was saying about God already. Uh, God's wisdom has been specifically seen in creation. The psalmist exclaims, Oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Psalm 104, 24. So the platypus is part of God's wisdom. He created interesting things. So the creativity of the universe comes out of his wisdom because of how he planned to use it and what he was trying to do. Let me straighten this a little bit. As God created the universe, it was perfectly suited to bring him glory, both in its day-to-day -day processes and the goals for what he created it. Okay. So there are two ways he mentions there that God is wise. He said, in creating the world, there are two things. The day-to-day -day processes. Okay. Are you part of creation? Okay. So he's wise in the day-to-day -day processes, exactly the way science works, the sun going up, the leaves and all of this. Of course, some of this, it, it has changed. And the goals or purposes. So it's big picture and small picture again. Goals, purposes, results, and moment by moment by moment. 
he wisely created just the way it's supposed to be. Of course, Genesis 3 and the fall changed a lot of it, but still, how magnificently it works, even though it's <laughs> so fallen. Even now, while we still see the effects of sin and the curse on the natural world, we should be amazed at how harmonious and intricate God's creation is. Okay, so I'm going to give you a thought homework. As you're going, this is such a beautiful time of year, and as you're just looking at creation, think, this is the fallen, ruined, eight or more thousand years of sin world. How amazing. You see a butterfly, or you, just particularly the turning of the seasons, all of it. Pregnancy. How amazing. Just meditate on it and give him glory. Because it, we can see it even in the fallen things. Um, God, uh, God's wisdom is also seen in his great plan of redemption. Okay, I have a question. God's wisdom is also seen in his great plan of redemption. What would a lot of people think about his wisdom and his plan for redemption? What's the big question a lot of people ask? When it comes to his wisdom and the plan for redemption, when do most of them think the plan for redemption came about? What book, where in the Bible? Genesis 3, right? Because everything is going really well, and then bam, we have Genesis 3. Okay, so here he talks about the fall. Who, whoops, now we need a plan for redemption. Okay, when he says this, we can, his perfect plan of redemption. When was the plan of redemption? This is creation here. This is Genesis 1. -1. When was the plan of redemption? established in his wisdom. Before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. Those of you at home, if you missed it, go back a, I don't know how many weeks. We're talking about BFW, before the foundation of the world. Still, I think it was unchanging. Okay? Before the foundation of the world, he already, in his wisdom, had the plan of redemption. So we human beings, Adam and Eve, in particular, did not goof up the plan of redemption. Over here, off the time chart, in his wisdom, he already had the perfect plan of redemption. Okay, I'm going to apply that to your life. I hear so many people tell me, and I've thought myself, I have blown what God was doing. I've messed up, I've ruined it. Big picture, small picture, I mean everything. When you speak the way you shouldn't speak to the people you love and share last names with and, you know, or you thought you were supposed to do something and you didn't do it, or you felt called into something you didn't get there, maybe other big or small choices in your life. And I hear people all the time, I'm so afraid I've kept up what God did. I've lost God's best. All right. Your life, to in totality, Compared to the plan of redemption for mankind, which one is the bigger plan? Okay, the, the plan of redemption is the only thing, humanly speaking, that matters. So at the fall of mankind and sin entering the world and Jesus Christ having to leave heaven and come and live on this fallen sinful world, agonizingly be killed on the cross and be resurrected. If that was planned before the foundation of the world, knowing this was going to happen, do you see in his wisdom your life is controlled and protected by him? If the biggest thing that ever is completely controlled, the plan of redemption out of his wisdom before the foundation of the world, so is every nanosecond, every nano neuron in your brain. He's either in control or it's not. And his word tells us, in wisdom he created, and you're part of that creation. So he has total wisdom, best purposes, best means, best results, always, in your life, because he's wise.
Christ, uh, God, God's wisdom is seeing the great plan of redemption. Christ is the wisdom of God to those who are called. 1 Corinthians 24, 30. Even though the word of the cross is foolishness to those who reject it and think themselves to be wise in this world. Okay, what we're going to do now is stop. We've kind of introduced this about Christ being wisdom and the plan of redemption. And what we're going to do is we're going to look up scripture and we're going to talk about what we can learn from the scripture about the wisdom of God. So what I want you to do is turn to 1 Corinthians 1, verses 17 through 30. I'll put it up here. And I'm going to put some questions for you. Okay, so you're now going to start being the researchers. You at home, I want you to do the same thing. When we pause, I want you to pause and research and do this yourself. Okay, 1 Corinthians 1. Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 30. And I'm going to add 2, 3 through 7. And now what I want you to do, I'm going to list some questions. I'll, I'll kind of get you the idea going here, and I'm going to list questions. And I want you to work with your partners, and I want you to see what you can find out about wisdom from this scripture. Um, what do we learn about wisdom? Okay. So just what can we learn about wisdom? Okay. And make your list. Everything you can find with your partner. Some of you start later and work back up rather than everybody just start at the beginning. Um, what words or concepts are linked? Like you might say, in another passage, it might be kindness and goodness are linked. Or in 1 Corinthians 13, um, now these three remain. The great, what is it? Love. Yes. Okay. The greatest these are love. So you go, wow, love and goodness are they're linked. Look and see what you can find. What words or concepts are linked? Like it might say, wisdom, comma, the goodness of God, comma. So goodness and wisdom would be the same thing, or wisdom, not the mean, the cruelty of God, or something. So look and see what he says. And can you see a relationship? What's the relationship? <coughs> between these linked words. Number three. Uh, what, now here we're going to have the opposites. What words are opposed to wisdom? So this is which ones are linked in a positive way, and now which ones are linked in a negative way. Um, what can we know about earthly wisdom? purposes. What are his purposes in using wisdom the way he does? Why does he do wisdom the way he does? And then six, any insights or thoughts or questions? Applications that you get from this. So, let me go over it again. Go to 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 32, 3 through 7, and look and write down everything you can find out about wisdom. Just make your list. Then two, um, look at what, in a positive way, what's linked or has a correlation or relationship with wisdom and why in a positive way, and then what's opposed to wisdom. Negative, and if you can figure out why, always why is a good question to ask. <clears throat> so you just don't get the answer, you have it. Then does, do we learn anything about earthly wisdom? And then why? What are the purposes for why he uses his wisdom the way he does? Why does he use wisdom? And then and just write down any thoughts you come up with. Got it? Okay, this is a big assignment. And so I'm going to give you a while to do it. You at home, get ready to start your, stop your computer. And you spend time doing this as well. Okay, go for it.
Hope you worked at home as hard as this group did. They've really been studious. But now I want to tell you again. I want you to become students of the Word and disciples of the people around you. This is how you do it. If you did your quiet time alone with the Lord, your Bible study every day like this, look how thoughtfully you would be studying the Word of God. Y'all just spent all this time on this. You can do the same things. Choose topics or choose scriptures and just ask good questions. And then think about it, just like you did. We didn't flip off in the Bible. You just thought about this. So let's read the scripture together, and then let's hear what you have to say. So we're in 1 Corinthians 1, and let's start at verse 17. It was originally started way down here. Went, well, we have to say this, so it's now expanded from two verses to quite a bit. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. What's another word for folly? Foolishness. Foolish. It's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is wisdom, I will destroy, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preached to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and the Greeks to seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, that's everybody, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And let's skip down to verses 3 through 7 in chapter 2. And... I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I mean, if we just wanted to discuss this line by line, we would be here for a couple of weeks. So, you're going to do that for me. Um, okay, so in reading all of this, what words or concepts did you see positively related or linked to wisdom? Call it out real loud. The power of God. The power of God. What else? Maturity. Humility. Humility. I'll say it out loud. Power of God. Maturity. Humility. What? Belief. Belief. Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Because in some of these, where we're getting these, if you, if you didn't see some of this, we go back to algebra. I'm always <laughs> tutored algebra and geometry, so I'm always thinking of it. 
Okay, remember, if A is equal to B, and B is equal to C, therefore A is equal to C. Trans is that the transfer? Property of... Uh, whatever. It's the property of something or other. Yeah. Okay? So, in some of these it says, he is wisdom of us, he is righteousness, so they begin to be very linked through whatever that wonderful process is in algebra. All right, some more. Anything else you saw there? I see Jesus. That's the first thing he did. Oh, okay. We just saw Jesus the whole thing. That's right. Jesus is wisdom. Anything else? Um, his secret will, will that he has now revealed. Secret will that what? That he has now revealed. What? That he's now revealed. Next we study will. Mm -hmm. That's an ad for our next mm -hmm. lecture. Excellent. Anything else? Superb. Um, would someone look up Romans 1.16 and tell me why I had you look up Romans 16 because of this phrase? Okay, now what's opposed to? What are some of the things that, that were opposed to or against or not positively related to wisdom? One starts with an F. Foolishness. Foolishness. All eight. So shorter word. Anything else? Human reason. What human reason? Now with human reasoning, God is not illogical by any means. But we're talking about a reasoning that is not based in, a, in biblical truth. So when we want to reason, we always want to reason with in the parameters of biblical truth. Because some people reason and they come to the conclusion, thinking on their brainy act self, that there is no God. So that's what we're talking about. Excellent. Does anything else you saw that was negatively related? Boasting. 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 Right. And we probably could take all of these and say the opposite. Because... If maturity is related to wisdom, then immaturity is not. What's the opposite of humility? Uh, disbelief, unrighteousness, and so, see, so it's the, all the opposites. Anything else that you saw in here that there was a negative relationship between the two? Well, I saw, I think I'm doing this wrong. I know you're not. Well, I saw wise and influential and noble as almost those were things that were a passage in, of wisdom, but the, they're not because okay. they're earthly. Okay, so you're saying it looks like influential and noble, having it all together, having good words and thoughts, which we would normally say these are excellent. They're even gifts that God gives people. So how is he, what's he talking about there? And he goes, you weren't influential, you weren't rich. Uh, I didn't come to you with these fantastic, I think Paul probably came with pretty good words. Okay. But he says, I didn't even come with eloquence of words or anything. So what do you, because it's not wrong to be eloquent in your words. What are all of those, what do you think he's probably trying to say? Wait, wait, let me know. You brought the question, I'm going to try and see if you can get it. The message and not the messenger. Well, also, remember we just talked about human reasoning? Okay. Somebody else is going to say something. So it's, I think it's similar to what we said about human reasoning. Who was going to talk to you? Somebody was. Oh, I was. But I kind of forgot what I was going to say. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it's catching. You're too our, close to me. Our <laughs> personal strengths or giftings can get in the okay. way of showing God's wisdom. That's right. Okay. Just our personal strength apart from God. For example, Paul saying, I didn't come to you with eloquence of words. I doubt there's anyone in the history of the word, world except for Jesus, who probably had more eloquent words than anyone else. It's Paul. But he's saying, it wasn't the eloquent words. It's God who did it. It wasn't the importance of the influence or the great reasoning powers or carefully worded something that did it. 
okay? They're not from God. It wasn't the human strength, the human wisdom, the human reasoning, the human whatever all those things that it said. Many of you weren't even of noble birth, okay? Because it doesn't matter. Peter was a dirty, smelly, ignorant fisherman, not of noble birth. Okay? Paul was probably the closest to what for a Jew would be noble birth. But he says elsewhere in here, in 2 Corinthians, it wasn't all about that at all. Okay? It's the power of God. Does that make sense? Does it help? <laughs> Does it or no? No, uh, no? Okay, can you ask me a question? <laughs> um, not right now. Okay, but maybe. so think through your question. Okay. Because okay, I need to know what it is that's confusing and then we can attack it. Good. Any other thoughts on what we just said? All right. Let me ask you something. This portion down here, when it says, um, not many of you are wise according to worldly standards or powerful or noble birth. God uses the foolish in the world and the weak and the low and the despised. Does, does that encourage you? But you don't have to be Paul. You don't have to be someone else in this room. Or someone else that you go, wow, I can't do what she can do. Look what he says. His wisdom, which is perfect, in his wisdom, he uses things that no one could imagine. A baby stuck in a manger, in a dirty old stable or cave, in some backwater nothing, became the savior of the world. That's what it's saying here. So if you go, well, oh, I don't have any of this, I don't have any of that eloquent stuff, God chose you and he wants to use you. Okay, first thing we said was the power of God, that his wisdom is the power of God. Why did I say Romans 1.16? Can someone read that to me? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Okay? The gospel is wisdom. His wisdom is the gospel. It's that A, B, B, C thing. Okay? Power of God. In sharing the gospel, it's not fancy words. Fanciest words in the world, the most articulate argument. If we knew twice as much as Dr. Grudem knew, and we could articulate, argue with anyone that never gets anyone saved. It's the power of God in the gospel that we're sinners and we need a Savior. And Jesus Christ came to earth, gave his life, paid for our sin debt, and was resurrected. And now when we place our faith in that, that applies to us. That's the gospel. And it is so wonderful that faint little children can even understand it. Mm -hmm. I know people that are uh, don't have full mental capacities, and yet they know the gospel. And I know a lot of people who are so brilliant, I can't carry their brain in my hands, they are so big. And they don't know Jesus. So see, the wise of this world are foolish when they don't have the wisdom of God which is the power of God, which is Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Anybody else want to make a question or comment? All right. What did we learn uh, about Earth? I was going to say, she said very succinctly, Christ is the manifestation of his wisdom. <clears throat> his wisdom is manifest. We can see it. You look at Jesus, you look at God's wisdom. That's why it doesn't matter what, what earthly gifts you have. He might be able to use them, but it's manifested in Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of wisdom. Mm -hmm. What else did it say about earthly wisdom? We kind of hit it here. I don't know if we need to go back over. Earthly wisdom with a little w. So it's foolishness. What else did it say? Anything else? No. Or, like birth, you know, noble birth. Or no, anything. It's just not worth anything. Okay, earthly wisdom is okay, and it might help you a few things, but it's 
folly compared, I mean, it's nothing. It doesn't exist compared to all of this. Because it's not the power of God. It's not Jesus. It's often contrary to God's ways. Yes. I mean, so often. Regularly it's contrary. Unless you just happen to stumble on wisdom that is scriptural. Mm -hmm. And you are doing the right thing. Um, we're going to get later talking about proverbial wisdom and that people who don't know God can actually learn and use the proverbial principles of wisdom. But actual wisdom itself, it only comes from Jesus Christ. And so a lot of times I agree with you. If you go, well, everybody else just thinks that. <laughs> I saw it on CNN. <laughs> saw it on some of those women talk shows. <laughs> okay. So I would be really careful what your source is. How about that question? What is the source that you gain wisdom from? Like you're trying to make decisions in your life. You're trying to decide about your body, your life, your children, your family, what you're going to do, go do. Where, what is your source? Because you need to know what your source is. Does it align with this? To know how much power you're going to put into it. Doesn't mean you can't get wisdom from earthly sources, but it's little w, and so much of the time it is contrary to godly wisdom, to the wisdom. Somebody else want to say something? I just wrote down that earthly wisdom is a stumbling block. It to sure true is. Wisdom. Remember that's a stumbling block. I mean, <laughs> how many times have I tried to figure it out with my brilliant human wisdom and I stumbled over truth? I mean, it was a stumbling block, particularly in salvation. Think of the mega minds and the scientists out of hand to say there is no God. And so their earthly wisdom makes them such a fool. Paul Psalm says, um, the, where is it? the fool says in his heart there is no God. I mean, boom. Okay, so it is a stumbling block, particularly when you come to Jesus Christ. Jesus. The wisdom, good. Anything else? All right. And what was the purpose? That he said, I use my wisdom the way I do, which is very different from the way the world does. Did you come up with a conclusion of why he uses wisdom the way he does? When he says, I, the things that the world thinks is great, it's foolishness to me. And my wisdom and my ways of doing it's different. And I use the things that are lowly and <coughs> unacceptable to the world. And that's his wisdom. Does he give us an excuse in this passage or reason why? So that nobody can boast. No boasting. Because it's all about pride, right? Mm -hmm. It brings him glory. What? It brings him glory. And it brings him glory. Our pride is glory. Because if it's the power of God, it can't be done by really smart thinking and all of that sort of stuff. It's all grace. And he gets all the glory. Verse, uh, verse seven. Um, verse seven. It says we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden, and that God destined for our glory before time began. When, and when glory is used there, is that more just? Yes. Of, 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 that's the, that's for our good. Okay. Okay. No. Not big cheap glory. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So see, it's all about pride. This is all about humility. This is all about pride. Ching! Figured it out. Boasting. And he says, God does his wisdom his way, so you can't boast. Is there another verse, like in Ephesians 2, that says something about boasting? So that no man may boast? It's by grace we've been saved. It's not a result of works, so no man may boast. It's all about God and his glory. And when we think we figured it out, when we think we've done it. So that's why the least in the kingdom is better than the best outside the kingdom. That's kind of what this is saying here as well. Any other thoughts? It makes me think of, um, since the two are contrary, that it, uh, in Romans, that they're without excuse. We're without excuse of breaking I'm not thinking. Okay, well that's Romans 1 where it says they exchanged, yeah, they thought they were so smart and they had it all together in Romans 1, 18 yeah. through 20 and yeah. so forth. And like where it's, 
it's so evident that it's like his his love and grace is ridiculous compared to our standard of working our way That's to exactly get things. Right. And so, so when you understand grace, the other is so full. It's easy to see that it's him versus. Do you remember that? Do you remember that like at ten thirty tomorrow morning? When you're thinking, oh, I'm not doing the right thing. I need to do more. I need to work more to make myself better. It's all grace. Mm -hmm. All grace. All grace. All grace. All grace. All grace. And all of this. Fantastic. Any other thoughts? Excellent. See, I don't have to do any work. Y'all do all my work for me. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go back to our book. Okay, let's just go back yet even. So we'll just go back to yet even, just a couple lines back. Yet even, when we talk about 1 Corinthians 1, 24 and 30, that the cross is foolishness to those who reject it and think themselves wise. We have a whole world that just thinks themselves so wise in all their smartness about rejecting the cross. <clears throat> yet even this is a reflection of God's wise plan. For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the foolishness, the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. God chose what is foolish to shame the wise, so that no human being might boast in the presence of the Lord. It's just what we've been saying. So he just reset it for us. Paul knows that when we now think what we now think of as the simple gospel message understandable even to the young, very young, reflects an amazing plan of God, which in its depths of wisdom surpasses anything man could have ever imagined. I mean, if we had to think it up, we never would have come up with the gospel. Never. You know. Then you got it. We just would There is no way. And then that's the amazing thing. This contrary thing going on, we just would have had works in there, and we would just been, it would be so foolish, so foolish. And, and it is amazing to me <clears throat> that the gospel is simple. Man is sinful, Jesus Christ died to save him. He's our rescuer, our redeemer from our sin. And we put our faith in him, we trust him for that. And yet, the libraries that have been written to talk about it just go on and on and on because it's simple but not simplistic. It's deep with the deep, rich wisdom of God himself, yet simple. And that's what the wise don't understand. At the end of 11 chapters, a reflection on the wisdom of God's plan of redemption, and this is all the way through Romans, so Paul spends 11 chapters, the best treaties, on redemption ever written in the history of the world and he's done it and he just can't help it. He just throws his head back and says, oh the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. I mean, oh the depth. I mean, no one could have written what he's written. And people spend entire walls of libraries talking about what he's written. And yet he is stunned. I, one of the things I want to point out to you where it says unsearchable and inscrutable, this doesn't mean they can't be searched or sought to be understood and, and doing what we're doing tonight. It doesn't say stay away from this, you can't get it. It's saying if you did it for all of eternity, you'd never get to the bottom. So it's, it's unbottomable. You can never get to the end. And the more you learn, the further you have to go. So that's what it's saying. Oh, the depth. The depth you cannot get. It's fabulous. You can't get to the bottom. It's that wonderful. Hallelujah. Romans 11.33. When Paul preaches the gospel, both the Jews and Gentiles, and they become unified in one body of Christ. Now what he does, because I know Dr. Grudem's, um, some of his priorities and focus. And he loves the church. He loves the plan of God in the church and what the church should be according to scripture. And so he's going to just wax eloquent here for a couple paragraphs 
on how wonderfully God display, wisdom is displayed in what his plan was for the church. Okay, when Paul preaches the gospel, both the Jews and Gentiles, and they become unified in the one body of Christ, Ephesians 3, 6, the incredible mystery that was hidden for ages in God who created all things, Ephesians 3, 9, is plain for all to see. Now remember, when mystery is used in scripture, it does not Agatha Christie. It doesn't mean, oh, surprise, the butler did it. That's not what a mystery is. A mystery means it was not revealed before, and now he's revealing it. And so the big mystery that's revealed in the New Testament that they did not know before it was announced was that God was going to do this thing in the church, that he was creating this body for him to have this relationship with, all the things it says about it in Scripture, and that it wasn't going to be a Jewish church or a Gentile church, but no more Jews and Gentiles. One united church. Black, white, yellow, brown, eyes uh, across the world, smart, little, skinny, tall, fat, everything, all united in Christ. That's the mystery he's talking about. Um, Hidden for ages who create all things is plain for all to see. Namely, that in Christ, such totally diverse people become united. When groups so different racially and culturally become members of the one body of Christ, then God's purpose is fulfilled. Ephesians 3.10, that through the church, the manifold, the manifold has the idea of many, many, many colors, or very, very varied, so many magnificent aspects. Wisdom of God might be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Today this means that God's wisdom is being shown to the angels and demons. Now, um, the angels are going, wow! And the demons are going, oh my goodness. This is a kink in our work. We've been planning for all these thousands of years, and now he throws the church at us. Great. Because they begin to see the wisdom of what God's doing. I mean, when people are in the church, there are no racial boundaries, there are no financial boundaries, there are no gender boundaries, all of the things, of course, appropriately, all of it, and they're going, oh, great. I mean, if you've ever read Screw Tape Letters by Lewis, this would be another thing. But you can't go, oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? We've never had such unification of believers. So they're astounded by the wisdom, but it challenges them. So that's what he's saying here. If the Christian church is faithful to God's wise plan, it will always be in the forefront of breaking down racial and social barriers in societies around the world and will thus be a visible manifestation of God's amazingly wise plan to bring great unity out of diversity and thereby cause all creation to honor him. And this is amazing. One thing that really excites me because the American church in particular has slept on these issues a lot. How far back do we go to the American church? Let's just go back to slavery. And there are a lot of things. Women's being treated equally. This church was pretty much asleep. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the church, a lot of churches, a lot of pastors, a lot of teaching, were not trying to cross these boundaries. Of course, they're wonderful, godly, the active church came alive. And they were the front of the movement for the liberation and all this. And, um, that's what they're doing. And right now, there's a big movement appropriately for social justice. Not doing good things just to do good things, but really trying to do this. To begin to be the body of Christ to the poor, to the marginalized, to bring true racial reconciliation. Our country's being torn apart, you know, 250 years or 150 years after the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, what's going on? And there's so many believers, and if you go back and if you've studied like the early civil rights movement in the 60s, when the, a lot of the American church went, oh, we didn't realize. And so floods of people pouring into Selma and to Alabama coming, it was believers, it was pastors, it was the church that came 
and walked with them and so forth. Not the black church that joined them. It was whites that came from across the country. So it's happening now. It's really exciting. Watch for what's going on and join. Be a part of it. I mean, that's just... And the angels are astounded. They're going, wow. Look what God is doing in the church. Any thoughts? God's wisdom is also shown in our individual lives. <clears throat> we know that God works all things together for good for those who love him who are called according to his purpose. Okay, so here we go back to purpose. Remember, wisdom is he always has the best purposes. Okay? And we are called according to his purpose, which is conformity to Christ. But remember, this says, he works all things together for those who love him. So are we talking about outside the church or inside the church in individual lives? Okay, we're talking about you inside the church. Here, Paul affirms that God does work wisely in all things that come in our lives. And that through all these things, he advances us towards the goal of conformity to the image of Christ, which is in 829. So again, with everything else, I love the all of Romans 8.28. And so we just said the wisdom is all about the gospel, and we saw that, everything else. Okay, now let's apply it very specifically to your life. Do you want the all of Romans 8.28 to be real for your life? Would you like all of your life to be worked together for God's good, for his glory, our joy, and our confirmation to Christ. Okay, so again, because of his wisdom, Romans 8.28 is true. It's the all. Remember our three things? Because he is wise, this... Oh, I'm going to get to that one. But remember, this is the best purpose, with the best timing, with the best results, with the best means. All of it just goes back to Romans 8, 28. He means it when he says all. So if he's going to be wise, the way we've defined him, Romans 8, 28, all must mean all. All, all, all. That he uses it. Comment? I want to make sure we have time. What I would like you to do... Okay, let me finish this and let me give you a second to, to discuss this with each other. Okay, Paul affirms that God does work wisely in all things that come in our lives. And that through all these things, he advances us towards a goal of conformity to the image of his son. It should be our great confidence and source of peace, I won't say day by day, sometimes moment by moment. To know that God causes all things to move us toward the ultimate goal he has for our lives. That we might be like Christ and therefore bring him glory. That's how it's the manifestation of the infinite beauty and worth of God. So when we're transformed into that image, we are manifesting the infinite beauty and wisdom and glory of God. All has to mean all. And if he's wise, it includes all. Such confidence enabled Paul to accept his thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12 as something that, though painful, God in his wisdom chose not to remove it. Without looking, can you say, what did he say? Don't worry about it. I'm not going to remove it. What did he say was sufficient? Grace. My grace. So see, we come back to grace again. We mentioned it in Ephesians 2. And uh, somewhere else. So here we have it in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Because he is wise, he says, I have the grace. I've got it figured out. With Paul's thorn, whatever it is, I'm sure Paul was going, come on, this can't be getting us where we need to get. Okay, do you have parts of your life that you don't feel like this is the way it should be going? Okay, you're not nodding your head. I wish I were living your life. <laughs> okay, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. All right. 
Um, okay, so there with Paul, Paul asked him, pleaded with him, would you please remove this, whatever it was? Probably physically painful, but we don't know how else. We don't know what else it is. And he asked him, so it's appropriate. Things in your life you would like God to change, beg him. And then you fall on his grace just like he did. My grace is sufficient for whatever. And you trust him that this is the best timing, the best means, with the best result. That's where wisdom comes in. Because, yes, just raw going, okay, my grace, I'll just trust you. But now you have another reason to trust him. Because he's wise. And he always uses the best means, with the best timing, with the best results. Always. Otherwise, whoops, he's not wise. And so, grace and wisdom enable us to trust him with all the hard stuff in your life. Whatever that is. From the beginning to the very end. All of it. Just like Paul. I am wise, so trust my grace. It's sufficient, whatever it is. Okay, what I would like to do is stop for a second and just, we've said a lot here. I want you just to think some more. If you want to talk with your neighbors, you can, but just go back over what we've done. I want you to just process for a few minutes and then see if you have questions or if it's something that just to process all that we've said. We've talked about, <laughs> too bad we don't have pages we can pull back. But with the Romans 8.28 and his promises of his wisdom and how that's related to grace, all of this in your life, not in the history of the world, but your very own life, okay? You at home do the same thing. Stop and take a few minutes to think. Good. I hope you had some good thoughts and wrote them down. Continue to do this. Meditate on things. So I've added this to the board. As we're thinking about this, and we're going to have to say some more things, but remember, because you are wise, because he is wise, this, whatever it is in your life or event, is the best means. This is the best timing, and this has the best results. So we can trust him. Romans 8.28. These are the alls of Romans 8.28. It's the means, the timing, and the results are all in that all of Romans 8, 28. A comment or a question? Put this in a way that helps you. We'll say it over and over. But you need to have this printed up and have it on a card. Have it on your phone. <laughs> have it because I have used it so many times. When it's hard. I don't use it when it's fun and easy and I have to go, what in the world am I going to do with all that extra money? Or whatever it is. Okay. But this is the hard stuff. Apply his wisdom to that. Let's read on some more here. Uh, we can know he's working wisely in our lives, even today, to bring us into greater conformity to the images of Christ. God's wisdom is, of course, in part, communicable to us. Now, one of the things that Dr. Graham did in his book is he separated incommunicable and communicable attributes. And what that means, things that belong only to God and things that he can share with us to some part. And in some way, wisdom is one of the ones that can be shared. Independence is not. We try to be independent, but it's not an attribute he shares with us. So that's what he, when he uses the term communicable, that's what he's saying. We can ask God confidently for wisdom when we need it, for he promises in his word, if anyone you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all men generously, and without reproaching it, it will be given to him, James 1, 5. All right. Don't read further in the book, because I have a real problem with this verse. Okay? And I've struggled for years. And I have gone to very wise people. And I have prayed, and I have listened to pastors teach on it. And most of the pastors, most of the teaching ends up that whole, if you receive it, you're really looking for it, you're hungry in the word, you're listening to the spirit, you're begging God, well, I don't know what to do. Give me the wisdom. 
and most of them talk about God giving you the wisdom you seek. Now, in my life, that has happened a lot. He has unbelievably shared great wisdom directly from the Spirit, just in me, from people I know, from studying, from good pastors. But I was widowed 16 years ago with five, ago with five very imperfect children still at home, with little ones, teenagers. And I'm just telling you, I was in the line when wisdom was handed out. I, did, I needed 10 times the wisdom I ever needed in my whole life. So much conflict, so much, do I do this or do I do that? I had to make all the decisions. I had to figure everything out. So I'm not just talking about financially and blah, 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 and all this. I'm talking about with the children. Do I don't? Do I say this? Do I let that go by? Do I, I don't know what to do. And then there are two of them standing here. I need this. I need this. I don't know which one. I can't do both. What do I do? I have been desperate for decades, a decade and a half at least, truly desperate for his wisdom. You link this with 2 Chronicles 20.12, where Jehoshaphat looks up and he says, Lord, we have no wisdom, and we have no power against this vast armies that are coming against us, but our eyes are on you. And wow, and the prophet says, Power's not your, the battle's not yours, it's the Lord. I am all over that. I didn't have to be convinced that God had to do it. He had to help me. I could not figure it out. Trying to seek true wisdom from all sources. Okay? My problem is it just didn't work all the time. And so deep in my heart, I had a deep wound down inside and I felt abandoned because I felt I had no greater capacity for seeking and asking him for wisdom. I begged him for wisdom. I cried. I would stand in front of my children going, Lord, I have no power against this vast army. I don't know what to do. You promised in your word you would give us wisdom. When we seek you and we seek your word and we're obedient to it, Now, millions of times, he was amazing. He has come through. He has worked with and with, without me. He has worked in my, our lives. It's a supernatural life. It really has been. But that other, there was a lot. So this verse is truly important to me because I think I understand what I mixed up and why I was frustrated. I don't know about you. I don't know if God always rushes in there with this great wisdom in all your circumstances. He did it a lot, but I was just so desperate. There was so much, and my deep heart was I really felt abandoned. Actually, it was on this sofa right here that I didn't even know I felt that. And I'd been sitting here talking to my good friend in that chair, and I stood up to walk out. It was in November on a Thursday afternoon. And I turned and I said, well, actually, I feel abandoned by God. And I didn't know those words. I didn't know that was in my heart. And then we sat down and we talked about this because it's this verse. And since he's used it, you're going to hear what I think God showed me, why the false belief I had. I wasn't wrong in depending on him. I wasn't wrong in seeking his wisdom right ways. All of that is the right thing. But I had a false understanding in here, I believe, of what I was seeking, okay? And the prompt, the question is, so this is my problem. This was, he says, he gives willingly. You ask him, he gives. So the first thing I ask, is it a promise or is it a principle? Because I was taking it 100% as a promise. So I think the answer to this is yes. I think it is a promise, but I think it's also a principle. Um, we just talked about in 1 Corinthians 1.30, he is unto us wisdom. It is Jesus who is the wisdom. So the answer is that I think it's both. Okay? It says in 1 Corinthians 1.30 that Jesus is to us wisdom. Okay. 
Does that say he has wisdom for us? Does it say he has wisdom? What is the verb? Is. He is wisdom. <coughs> it is Jesus who is the wisdom. Of course he has wisdom. He's so wise. But he is wisdom itself. Um, okay, now let me tell you, let me explain it some more, and I'm going to do a little Greek thing here with you. Okay, some of the versions say, He became unto us wisdom. And I'm explaining to you why, how we can do this. So that when you are truly seeking God and you're not getting the wisdom you think you're supposed to be getting, I'm going to prove to you you're not being abandoned. And we need to keep on seeking. Okay, uh, he be, the verb is not actually the verb is, like some of the translation. It really is more the word became. Um, it means a change of condition or state. So it is a change of condition or state, and it implies motion, growth, and movement. So in English, it doesn't come across like that. It sounds like boop. It just is. But it has motion and change and movement to it. This is why it's so important to know what the original language really says. This says so much more than our word. He is. He became. Sounds like a static thing. But the verb itself actually has this motion of movement and change to it. Um, <clears throat> it's used for God's actions coming out, emerging out of eternity, and then showing and manifesting himself in real time. So the whole idea is that Jesus, of course, in eternity, he is wisdom. And this verb has the idea, idea of the movement that out of eternity, he's moving, and he's, this wisdom is in motion, coming into real life. What is the word? It up. Something or other. I don't know what the Greek word is. I don't think I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. You can look it up. Yeah. Um, okay, we do need to look at the first Corinthians 30, 130. Look at the verse. Because I have questions to ask you. Y'all are my Bible teachers. I'm not saying. I, of course, I'm not disqualifying that he doesn't. I'm just saying it didn't just show up at my door every second what I thought it should be. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us, and that was he came out of eternity and moved into real life. And it has... Emotion, it's not static, it's movement to us. He became to wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that we will boast in the Lord. Okay? So it's like redemption, righteousness, and, and sanctification. I am redeemed. I am righteous. I am sanctified. Done deal. At the cross, it happened. However, I am being continually sanctified, and I'm becoming more righteous as I'm being transferred, uh, transformed. There's movement and change. It's becoming a reality in my life. Already, absolutely, but not yet. And so I think... Because we can say that with understanding, we've talked about that in here before, about righteousness and, and sanctification. Um, we're already redeemed, but he's, uh, it's paid for, but he's changing my life. I am being transformed continually, speaking the gospel. I'm being redeemed in the way of being transformed. I think it's the same thing with wisdom. There is great wisdom. Jesus is wisdom to us. And his word and he himself has the, 
uh, oh, the depth of the riches of the one wisdom of God. That is absolutely true. But I think it's like sanctification. I think it is progressive also. And that he is revealing himself to me more and more and more. And I'm increasingly understanding and knowing him and becoming wise and receiving his wisdom. Do I have more wisdom than I had 16 years ago? You know, does this cup hold what the Atlantic Ocean can? It's been astounding. The movement has been amazing. It's coming from Christ. And he has availed me all the time. But I think it's an already, but not yet as well. Um, I think it says to act. It says, ask in James 5, 1, 5. Ask and it will be given to you. And the ask, when you look again in the Greek, guess what form it is? Do you think it's a one-time word? No, it's present progressive. Ask and ask and ask and ask and ask and ask. It's present continuous. Continue and it will be given. Sometimes, boom. Oh, yes, I understand. I know what I mean. And sometimes it's over a process of time. The best time. As he's re what? The best means, the best time for the That's best right. results. So in his wisdom, sometimes having it all, guess what? <coughs> Cha-ching. If he'd given me all the answers I wanted all the time, to, sure, I'll like to Santa Claus. Hey, Santa Claus, I need to know exactly what it is. Thank you very much. Okay, and I would have been pride. Instead of seeking him, seeking him, seeking him, that's the wisdom of it. That you're continually asking him instead of going, don't worry, I can figure this out. Oh, can you tell me, text, 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 text. What does Pinterest say? What are they saying on Facebook? I need to go to all my girlfriends. Where do you turn first when you need to figure something out? Do you turn to your text first? Do you go to Pinterest? Do you go to whatever little blog or thing or whatever? Is that where you turn? Or are you continually going to him? I need your wisdom. I need to know what to do. I need to know what to think. I need to know where in here the answer is. So I immerse myself in this. And I'm asking, is that not wise? That the wisdom is the asking and the seeking. And of course, he is wisdom. He does. I have lived so far beyond my capacity. Unbelievable because of the wisdom he has given me. However, there's a huge gap. Because there's so much that wasn't handed to me. His timing was involved. And some of it I may never know. I don't care. Okay. I'm seeking him. Um, and then there's the problem of pride. I think the reason is Santa Claus God. He's not a Santa Claus God in anything else, even with his wisdom. Oh, cha-ching. Oh, you just asked. Sure. And then, thanks, God. You know, everybody come to me. I have all the way, I have it all figured out. All I have to do is ask Santa Claus God. Um, okay, and now another thing. Okay, question. Somebody want to ask me questions? Mm -hmm. That's why I think it's a promise and a principle. I think it's both of them. Um, a question? I love the application that you've said before that, and I don't know if it was after you came to this realization that you started doing this, but it's helped me when you say, God, I'm asking you for your wisdom. I'm asking you for your answer. I haven't heard a specific response. I'm going this way. So if it's not your will, I'm trusting you to stop it. And then okay, just... so you're talking about the actual process. Right. Let's say we have to make a decision. You're either going to refinance the house or you're not. Your child is either going to go to this party or they're not. I don't know. You have to redo the transmission in the car or not. Just their real-time decisions. And so, again, I didn't figure that out, what you're saying on my own. I saw excellent wise counsel, sought the word, talk, asked God, look in scripture, and the process I found out, let's say, I have to make a decision. I've either got to get another car or put an $8,000 transmission in the car. I have to make a decision. And I've studied, and I've talked, and I've looked, and I've researched all the prices, and all blah, 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 and then prayed about it. 
I don't know. So what she said, what I personally do is I say, okay, Lord, I have to make a decision. This is what I'm thinking. You did want all of it. I'm really asking. And I will do. You lead me. I will do whatever you say. You send me wisdom. Give me a check in my spirit. I'm listening to you. Okay, if you don't say anything else, then this is what I'm going to do. I've decided, actually, I'm not going to repair this car. I'm going to do this. So what I want you to do is stop me. Please stop me. Now, do I hear all the time from him well? Of course not. Do we hear perfectly? No. Have I probably made mistakes and unwise decisions? Well, we live in a real world. And he's a very practical God. And when I'm seeking him, when we're doing this, that's why we can count it all joy. Verse 2 up above. That's why we count it all joy. Because we're seeking him. And we can trust him. And that all, you know that from the 828 all? Okay, and with wisdom, the all. My not knowing more or hearing some special information is part of the all. Oh, wow, I guess I shouldn't have done that. But I count it all joy because he is wise and Romans 8, 28 is true. But I've tried to follow through this procedure of getting the answer. Um, does that make sense? Question? I do have a question about that. How does that play into discernment? To what? Did, like having discernment. Like having... Judging it. I mean, exactly like what this? you just said. Yes. It's is discernment. It, is it... Okay, well, there's even someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ, who's lived 70 years and lived a fairly decent life, they're going to have some discernment and wisdom apart from God, just from raw life experience. Okay? Are you talking about like a gift of discernment or just human discernment? I guess... Just being you, discerning? Just being discerning based on... You know, the wisdom, or are they sure. hand in hand? Are I they, think the discern is wisdom and discernment the same, mm -hmm. or are they not? I would say they're linked, mm -hmm. okay? To be discerning, um, discerning is probably maybe some of the active force of wisdom, and that you want to be discerning, you know, maybe... You've studied what God says, you've lived a life, you begin to see principles in Scripture, and you meet someone and they conduct themselves in a certain way and go, hmm, don't want my daughter dating this guy. <laughs> okay. I'm discerning from his conduct some things he's said that he doesn't have the kind of character that lines up with this that I want for my daughter. Is that a wise decision? Yes. Is that based on what I know of him and how he's worked in my life? And, and then you still want to go and ask him, so I would say discernment's very closely linked. Or discernment might be how we actively use the wisdom. But again, if you're not, we're not still talking 100% because we're fallen. And we just aren't going to have it all figured out. But there's such wisdom available. And what reason I'm kind of passionate is because I kind of drained the cup. And I was left with a lie. And the lie wasn't true. And that's what I'm trying to explain, because in your life, if you get really desperate for him and his wisdom, and you go to that James 1, 5 verse, you may be disappointed if you think it's a raw, pro raw promise, and not also a developmental principle, or a process, process principle. Does that say? And I think discernment's thrown in there. Yes. This is where people are discerning people, because they know the word. And then... They relate the word to their, their life. Like what I've just told you. Before I learned that, when I was still sitting on, the, on this t table, uh, sofa here, I didn't understand it. Yet I had sought and sought and sought. It was this conversation and what the whole, in fact, the Holy Spirit just had me say it. I didn't even know I was going to say it. Okay? And then out of that comes all of this. And such peace. I have so much peace and joy floundering through life because I'm floundering on Him. 
I am seeking him to be becoming and be my wisdom to me and his word. Okay, and he gets a new, guess where we get wisdom? Where do you think we get our main source of wisdom? Okay, so you, everybody raise your hand. Who would like to be really, really wise and make super wise decisions the rest of your life? Okay, you can't do it apart from this. So just that is going to be cut off to you because you will not know Jesus. And he has become unto us wisdom. So the idea here is not going, do, let's see, transmissions, transmissions, or <laughs> dating, um, that's not going to be here. There are principles, but it's, I need to know Jesus Christ. And this is how I know him, to spend time in this word. And again, what you did today is what you need to do all the time. Get into the word, ask questions, apply your life into it. We're going to have to stop. Do you have any questions for me or comment? Do you think it's kind of a perception issue that we as humans want something tangible? I'm sorry, the, the end of this verse where it says, um, you know, if we ask, it will be given to us. We, we want the tangible. When he's saying, I've given you Christ Jesus, he is your wisdom, you will And I'm saying it's this. both. Because I think it's right. a principle and a promise. Right. Okay. Clearly. I know my I'm perception not, is I want. Yes, we want it all. I want it 100%. Yes. And I thought, if I'm this desperate, I am 100% desperate. I didn't have a capacity to be more desperate. I'm going, hmm, something's failing here. And um, it's because I thought it was a 100% guaranteed promise. That if I did my part, boom, I would have it. So I think it's both. And we will never arrive here on this earth. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have it. But it is process. It's knowing him. He is the wisdom. So that's how you can count it all joy. When you're a buffoon and you don't know what you're doing, you're going, I don't know what to do, Lord, but this is what I'm going to do. I don't know. I mean, I said to my children, I don't know what to do. I'm going to go talk to him. Okay, now I'm going to tell you the back side of that story. Now my children are all over 20. And I'm hearing from them, I know some of you heard this before, but it's so powerful. I thought it was failure because I didn't know what to do. That depended on him and seeking his wisdom and begging him and going to great wise counselors and people to give me insight. And I still didn't know what to do and floundered right? Operating so far above what I could have because of Jesus, but a flounder, okay? Because I thought, cha-ching, need to have the wisdom. Well, let me tell you, now that my children are in growing things in their young adulthood and so forth, and they're hitting brick walls, and they have challenges, and guess what they're doing? They're going, oh Lord, we have no power against this vast army that's coming against us, but our eyes are on you. So look at the great wisdom of his having me do that a million times to my kids. And guess what they came out? Well, mom doesn't know everything, but she knows who does. And so now their default switch, hopefully, will increasingly be, our eyes are on you. Okay? Talk about wisdom. That's the wisdom of not having the wisdom. So let me encourage you in this, and you at home, the same thing. Okay, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you are to us, and particularly tonight we focus on your wisdom. Thank you that we can trust you. Thank you that this is the best method, this is the best timing, this will be the best results. Thank you that we can trust you. Thank you, our omnipotent, good, sovereign, loving God, that you are available to us, you have this word, and you do have wisdom available all the time. And everything that comes from you is wisdom, and we thank you. Lord, I ask you again, if anything was said or understood that's not from you, please let it evaporate. If that which is from you, plant deeply in our hearts. Let us hunger and thirst for more of you and less of ourselves. To be all the glory and honor and praise. Amen. Okay, I